So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah. All right. In this video, I want to talk about pulling the thread. And this is an analogy for what people do when you present to them an obvious truth. And I see this happen a lot when I talk to Catholics and atheists, more often than other groups. Other groups will do the same thing, but they do it quite often at the drop of a hat. And what this is, is when you present somebody with the truth, and you show them evidence to show that it is true. And not only that, you show the evidence that shows the opposite is true so you really solidify the argument right so you use logic and reason and evidence to show how you are right and how they are wrong and when you do this they are convicted so what is it they do they look for a thread to pull so that they can ignore it because they're convicted that it's true and you can tell this by the changing of the subject. Or they'll say some other scenario. What about this and that? And just going off to something else. And then they want to go down this rabbit trail. And a lot of times you may go down with them and allow them to change the subject and answer all these objections and questions. But it's it's almost pointless because what they're looking for is not actual answers. If you're able to provide all the answers and talk about all the subjects and show how you are right on all of this and they're wrong on all of it, they don't care. They're looking for just one thing. That's all they need. One thing that they, they can doubt you on and then they're going to doubt everything. Right? So even if this is something as simple as you're saying that 2 plus 2 is 4, and let's say the Catholics believe 2 plus 2 is 5, and atheists believe 2 plus 2 is 3. And you show them simply, well, if I hold two fingers in my left hand, and I hold two fingers in my right hand, and I, I bring them together, so I'm putting 2 and 2 together, 2 plus 2, and I count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, I get 4, right? I don't get three, I don't get five, I always get four. I can do this with two rocks in each hand, two apples, two oranges, two of anything. And if I bring them together, I'm always going to get four. If And then you show them if you put one finger in one hand and two in the other, you bring it together, you get three. So two plus one is three, not two plus two. So you disprove the atheist point of view. And then you show, hey, if I put three fingers in the left hand and two in the right and I bring them together, I'm going to get five. No matter what I do, if I bring three and two together, I get five. It's not two plus two that equals five. It's three plus two that equals five. So you show how their view is wrong. Then they're going to just go, well, what about five plus five? What do you believe about this and that? And, and then they're just trying to find anything to say you're wrong. And if they can find anything, anything, then they're going to dismiss what you had to say about two plus two. So you need to be aware of this. And what I tend to do when I'm in these conversations with these people is I try to stay on the subject and not let them jump around. 
and be like, hey, well, what's the point of going on to these other points if you're not going to face the facts about this one point? Two plus two is four, right? If you can't accept the truth that this is right in your view that it's three or five is wrong, why are we going to jump to other questions that I'm going to answer just for you to reject it? You try to force them to stay on that and to deal with the conviction of it being true. Doesn't work too well. You know, none of these tactics that I bring up actually work well at all because ultimately it doesn't matter, right? That if people don't want to accept the truth, they're not going to accept it. No matter if you found this amazing way to explain truth and to expose error where there's no doubt, it doesn't matter. People who want the truth, you could give it to them in a, in a simple way. They're going to accept it. People who don't want it, you can give it to them in every way possible. They don't care. They're not going to accept it. Right? But I like to try to keep them in that conviction. Because what they're trying to do is run from it. And if you can keep them in that conviction, there's a chance that they're going to be like, you know what? I'm right and this is wrong. And if they can concede at one point, a wall is broken down and they've accepted just a little bit of truth. And that is all that it actually needed. Because once you accept a little bit of truth, it's easier to accept more truth. When you're able to admit you're wrong about one thing, it's easier to admit you're wrong about another. And you end up eating humble pie, and you let go of your pride and your arrogance and your ego, and they're able to put it aside and start saying, well, yeah, I was wrong about these things, and this is right about all this. And they're able to follow the breadcrumbs of truth all the way to Jesus. But the first step is actually getting to them to accept just one little thing of truth. And in this case, I was talking about 2 plus 2 equals 4. But this could be with anything. Such as with atheists, what I like to talk about is how evolution is not true. Because with DNA, you actually see a degradation. You don't see addition, right? Complexity. Uh, increasing, that is. Uh, when you take uh, the parents of any species, two wolves, two horses, two people, the children are not going to have more information in the DNA than the parents or in the uh, chromosomes, right? So if the parents have a thousand base pairs in the DNA, they have 10 chromosomes. I'm just keeping things simple. Low numbers, easier to comprehend. Then it, the children will not have more than that. So if a parent has a, a thousand base pairs in the DNA and 10 chromosomes, and then the uh, other parent has 900 base pairs and eight chromosomes, even though the child is going to have, let's say, 950 base pairs now, and nine chromosomes, because they get half from each parent, you can see, oh yeah, it has more than one parent, but it's never going to get more than the parent that has the most. Right? That's the key there. It's never going to surpass the parent that has the most. Okay? And if there is any additions, where there's times, you could probably bring up examples where there's more base pairs or chromosomes. Well, Look at all of them, and you'll notice that they're always defects. When there's more information added to the DNA because of duplication, which the atheists like to say that it's these copying of the DNA, the duplications that bring about the new information and create new complex creatures or what have you. That's not true because science shows us stuff that we can actually observe and test and reobserve, right? Actual science shows us that. Whenever there's those kind of additions, it's always harmful. There's always these defects that are crippling. And when the same thing happens with the chromosomes, you have something like Down syndrome. You have defects. You don't have benefits. There's not any scientific evidence to show 
any of these additions actually benefit. So there's no reason to believe that it in the past that it, this happened. That's imagination. That's speculation. That's not science. That's not truth. You're just believing what you want to believe. You're going by faith while you're also condemning faith at the same time. You're being a hypocrite and a fool. And if they can't accept that, there's really no point in moving on and talking about anything else. Right? Uh, one little detail I'll, I'll add to that is they might bring up something, uh, an experiment they done, did with yeast, where the scientists added a chunk of information into the DNA of the yeast to allow it to be able to digest uh, some other food. And they put it into some of the yeast, and it actually worked. It stuck into the DNA, and they were able to digest this new food, right? But there is actually three problems that happen. One, you showed intelligent design where the information had to be put in from an outside source. It didn't naturally happen, right? Second is, after time, the yeast corrected the DNA and actually removed the addition. And even when they had offspring, while they had the corrected DNA, they never passed on that new information that was given. So even with intelligent design, adding it in, the DNA corrected itself. So, uh, yeah, if an atheist can't accept that, it's like, what's the point in talking about anything else? And then with a Catholic, I, I could talk about uh, many different things. Uh, one that I'll bring up here as an example is Matthew 16, where the paragraph to start the whole conversation about Peter being the rock is about who Jesus is. And when you look at this same passage in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, there is nothing in the slightest that even points to Peter being referred to as the foundation of the church in any way whatsoever. It's only in Matthew where there's something that you can take to twist to try to say that Peter is the rock. And Peter is the one that stands up and says, hey, you're, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus is like, yes, and you are Peter, and upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Right? And he says that gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, your confession of who I am, that's the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church is the fact that I'm the son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against me. As later on in Matthew 16, Satan influences Peter. And Jesus has to rebuke Satan out of Peter. Just like a paragraph or two right after that. So the gates of hell prevailed against him, just like that. Showing you he is not the foundation. Not to mention that Peter is a word, Petros. So you go, Simon, you are Petros. And upon this Petra, I'll build my church. So Jesus is not saying... You are the rock, and I'm going to build upon you, Peter. Now he's saying, you're Petros, and you're built upon your confession of who I am, Petra. As in 1 Peter chapter 2, when Peter refers to us as all being lively stones, he says that Jesus is the rock of offense. He says that he is the Petra of offense. And all throughout the New Testament, whenever Petra is used in the Greek, it's always in a reference to Jesus, never to Peter. Because it's Jesus who is the foundation, and there's nothing else in the scriptures that leads you to think that Peter is the foundation of the church, or that he is the vicar of Christ, or the head of the church, or that he is uh, the Pope, or Pontifus Maximus, or anything like that. Nothing. And if they can't accept this truth here, which most of them that I've talked to, can't 
well, it's like, what's the point in going on other things? Because that's exactly what will happen when you talk to an atheist about the DNA. You talk to the Catholic about Matthew 16 and showing him how the Orthodox, they don't believe that nonsense that the Catholic Church believes about it. And that's what causes that great schism where they think that their bishop of Rome is the head of all the bishops. That's not something that's scriptural. And the, the Orthodox are saying, hey, you got the wrong interpretation of Matthew 16. You're taking one passage and you're building a whole doctrine. That's what cults do. Cults will take one passage, one verse, and build doctrine off of it. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church has done. So you, you point these things out to them. Are they going to talk about it and actually show how you're wrong? No, because they can't. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, well, the early church fathers say this. And, you know, some scientists speculate that, you know, it could have happened. <laughs> Maybe, you know. Right. They're going to talk about speculation and imagination. Like with, with the atheists, we actually got science showing them they're wrong, but they're going to ignore that and go by faith in a speculation and an imagination. And you got the inspired word of God showing the Catholics how they're wrong. And they're going to go by the opinions of some other people that agree with them. Holding that person's opinion above the inspired word of God. And then they'll end up changing subjects. My Catholic will tend to talk about something like, oh, the Eucharist. All of a sudden, they're just going to talk about the Eucharist, <laughs> right? And then it's like, okay, well, then, all right, well, we can talk about that. It's just another truth you're going to reject. For some reason, you don't like the truth, right? And then the same thing with the atheists. They're going to jump to something like morality and talk about God's morality. And it's like, okay, well, you see, Mr. Atheist, let's say, just for the sake of argument, God is immoral. Does that change the truth of the evidence we find through science about DNA and how things are falling apart? Like the laws of thermodynamics say that things don't randomly gain information and become more complex. So if life started out with just a hundred base pairs of DNA in it. How could we get to the point of man having billions of base pairs if you cannot add to what is there? You can only subtract and duplicate what is already there. And I don't mean multiply, I mean make a copy of it. So you can have a child with a hundred base pairs or less, but you can never have more. So if you can never increase, because that's what science shows us, how can you go from simple life to more complex life? Hmm? You know, how does this truth now change just because, for the sake of argument, God is immoral? It doesn't. What you're showing is that you just disagree with God. You don't like God. It's not that he doesn't exist. As this evidence about evolution shows that there's a creator, things were created and they're falling apart into disorder because they're not going by the way he created them. They're going astray, going uh, a way that they weren't designed to go. Such as if you try to use a hammer as a saw and a saw as a hammer, those tools are not going to work and they're going to break down because you're not using them the way they were meant to be used, right? So just because you don't like God and you think he's immoral doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Right? And the same thing with the Catholic. Okay, you want to talk about the Eucharist. How does that change the fact about Matthew 16 being about Jesus being the foundation, not Peter? Peter being built upon that foundation of his confession of who Jesus is. Right, so you bring them back to to the to the information to the truth that they're rejecting, because there and there's really no point in to go and answer every objection, because even if you like I said you answer those objections that they have, showing how God is not immoral, showing how the bread and wine is actually the word of God, that you are to live off of the spiritual food of the word of God. They don't care if you show they're wrong there; they'll jump to something else. And if you show they're wrong there, they'll jump to something else because they're looking for a thread. 
looking for anything they can pull. So if they could find a thread to pull, and they'd be like, you're wrong about this. Because let's say you are wrong about something. Uh, let's say you think something weird, like 5 plus 5 is 11, or you think the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. And you're wrong. You'd be like, oh, you're wrong about that. You, you, you're you a Cowboys fan. You thought they were going to win the Super Bowl. Uh -huh, they didn't. That means you're wrong about everything. I can dismiss everything you ever said. Yay, now I can go back to my delusions and my lies and pretend that I'm living in the truth. And their conscience is now quenched and they feel better about themselves. And Yeah. So the whole point is to not let them do that. But even then, when you keep them on subject, they're just going to end up trolling, getting upset. They're not going to face the truth. So it's best once you get them to focus on that subject and you realize they're not budging, you just end it. You walk away. Right? And that's that. I mean, you can't force people to accept the truth. Right? You don't sit there and argue with a brick wall. You don't argue with a parrot. You don't argue with a dog or a pig, right? Yes, I hope you don't. It's just how it is, right? Sometimes we, we mistaken these things for actual intelligence. But that's uh, not always the case. And when you learn... That's how they are. Realize they're just looking for a thread to pull so that they can stay in their delusion. And best thing to do probably is just to stop. Realizing that conversation ended with them rejecting the truth and that they have no thread to pull. Because sometimes what ends up happening is you get frustrated and you might troll back a bit and mock them or insult them, say some things that maybe normally you wouldn't say that not aren't necessarily evil, but they'll use your impatience and your reaction, whether there was some kind of hostility or anger to it, even if you're being sarcastic and joking about it, they'll interpret it as aggression and be like, oh, look, you're immoral and you're no different than I am. That means I can dismiss everything you said. So you gave them a thread in a different way. And they'll pull that and use it to justify staying in their delusion. So just some things to think about when you're witnessing and you're talking to people. You probably deal with this when talking to family and friends. They look for anything. You show you're right about one thing. Well, you're wrong about this. You remember that time when you were five years old and you believed in Santa Claus? <laughs> well, then I'm going to dismiss everything you said because you're obviously stupid. Right? And that's their, their mindset. That could be the threat at times. Because they'll get so desperate that they'll bring up something like when you were three and you believed the tooth fairy. It's like, okay. <laughs> that's your thread. All right. Nothing I can do about that. Right? But anyway. Thanks for watching, and take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12, at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our of our faith and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. 
And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29. When he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple. Very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him. And to know who is not of him. He gave us his word. And it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him. Then. Obviously. It's somebody else. Trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you. Right. What does Jesus tell us about the word? In John 17. 17. He says sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit, and become one with his Spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word, you are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life, you want to be sanctified, you need to get into the word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it 
to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness, he says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet, the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously, he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying, this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That 
lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation, fake feigned words, flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. <laughs> you have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. <laughs>